duties underscore my commitment to the mission of law enforcement and the honor that I have to serve as a nation's chief law enforcement officer. I have provided the committee with a lengthy written statement detailing some of the department's work under my leadership to protect our nation, our children, and our civil rights. I am proud of our past accomplishments in these and other areas, and I do look forward to future achievements. I am here, however, to answer your questions, not to repeat what I have provided in writing. But before we begin, I want to make three brief points about the resignations of the eight United States attorneys, a topic that I know is foremost on your minds. First, those eight attorneys deserve better. They deserve better from me and from the Department of Justice, which they serve selflessly for many years. Each is a fine lawyer and dedicated professional. I regret how they were treated, and I apologize to them and to their families for allowing this matter to become an unfortunate and undignified public spectacle. I accept full responsibility for this. Second, I want to address allegations that I have failed to tell the truth about my involvement in these resignations. These attacks on my integrity have been very painful to me. Now, to be sure, I, have been, I should have been more precise when discussing this matter. I understand why some of my statements generated confusion. And I have subsequently tried to clarify my words. My misstatements were my mistakes, no one else's. And I accept complete and full responsibility here as well. That said, I've always sought the truth in every aspect of my professional and personal life. This matter has been no exception. Never sought to mislead or deceive the Congress or the American people. To the contrary, I have been extremely forthcoming with information. As a result, this committee has thousands of pages of internal Justice Department communications and hours of interviews with department officials. And I'm here today to do my part to ensure that all facts about this matter are brought to light. These are not the actions of someone with something to hide. Finally, let me be clear about this. While the process that led to the resignations was flawed, I firmly believe that nothing improper occurred. U.S. attorneys serve at the pleasure of the president. There is nothing improper in making a change for poor management, policy differences, or questionable judgment, <coughs> or simply to have another qualified individual serve. I think we agree on that. I think we also agree on what would be improper. It would be improper to remove a U.S. attorney to interfere with or influence a particular prosecution for partisan political gain. I did not do that. <coughs> I would never do that. Nor do I believe that anyone else in the department advocated the removal of a U.S. attorney for such a purpose. Recognizing my limited involvement in the process, a mistake I freely acknowledge, I have soberly questioned my prior decisions. I have reviewed the documents available to the Congress, and I've asked the Deputy Attorney General and others in the department if I should reconsider. What, I've, what I have concluded is that although the process was nowhere near as rigorous or as structured as it should have been, and while reasonable people might decide things differently, my decision to ask for the resignations of these U.S. attorneys is justified and should stand. I've learned important lessons from this experience, which will guide me in my important responsibilities. I believe that Americans focus less on whether someone makes a mistake than on what he or she does to set things right. In recent weeks, I've met or spoken with all of our U.S. attorneys to hear their concerns. These discussions have been open and frank. Good ideas were generated and are being implemented. I look forward to working with these men and women to pursue the great goals of our department. I also look forward to continuing work with the department's career professionals, investigators, analysts, prosecutors, lawyers, and administrative staff who perform nearly all of the department's work and deserve the credit for its accomplishments. I want to continue working with this committee as well. We have made great strides in protecting our country from terrorism, defending our neighborhoods against a scourge of gangs and drugs, shielding our children from predators, and preserving the integrity of our public institutions. And recent events must not deter us from our mission. I'm ready to answer your questions. I want you to be satisfied 
to be fully reassured that nothing improper was done. More importantly, I want the American people to be reassured of the same. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Attorney General. Your um, former Chief of Staff testified under oath about a conversation which Carl Rove told you about complaints of former New Mexico U.S. Attorney David Iglesias and two other U.S. Attorneys were not being aggressive enough against so-called voter fraud. When did such a conversation between you and Carl Rove take place? What, what I recall, Senator, is that there was a conversation where Mr. Rove mentioned to me concerns that he had heard about uh, pursuing voter fraud, election fraud, in three jurisdictions, New Mexico, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as I recall. How many, uh, going back to New Mexico, how many conversations about New Mexico with Mr. Rove? Senator, I can only recall of that one conversation. You recall when that was? Senator, my recollection was it, it was in the fall of 2006. Do you, remember, do you remember where? No, sir, I don't remember where that conversation took place. And, and Senator, I don't, I don't recall either whether or not it was a phone conversation or it was an in-person conversation, but uh, I, do, I do have a recollection of that conversation. So when, when was David Iglesias added to the list of uh, U.S. attorneys to be replaced? Of course, Senator, when I accepted the recommendation, uh, I did not know when Mr. Iglesias was in fact rec added to the uh, recommended list. As I've gone back and reviewed the record, it appears that Mr. Iglesias was <coughs> added sometime between, I, th I believe, October 17th and December 15th. Uh, but I was not responsible for compiling that list. Is added either that list. before or after the elections, but you don't know when? Is that what you're saying? Senator, I just, I just respond as to when I, when I believe. As, I look, as I've gone back and looked at the documents, it appears he was added sometime between October 17th uh, and November 15th. I understand. <clears throat> but you don't know when. Senator, I, I have no recollection of knowing okay. when that occurred. Do you know why he was added? Again, Senator, I w uh, was not responsible for compiling that information. The recommendation was made to me. I was not surprised that Mr. Iglesias was recommended to me because I had heard about concerns about the performance of Mr. Iglesias. From? C certainly, I'd heard, from, I'd heard uh, concerns from Senator Domenici. And who else? Well, S Senator, certainly, and Car and Carl what, I, what I know, I, I heard concerns raised by Mr. Rove, and what I know today, what I don't recall the, uh, the specific mention of this conversation, I recall the meeting, is that there was a meeting in October uh, with the president, in which the president, as, as, I, as I understand it, uh, relayed to me similar concerns about pursuing election fraud when was in that? three jurisdictions. Senator, it was, I've gone back and looked at my schedule, and it appears that the, the, that meeting occurred on October 11th. Now, Mr. Glacius has been described by your former chief of staff as a diverse up-and-comer. He was reportedly offered the job as the head of the executive <coughs> office of the United States Attorneys for you here in Washington. He was selected by the Department of Justice to instruct other U.S. attorneys on investigating and prosecuting voter fraud. This past weekend, the Albuquerque Journal reported that when Senator Domenici told, this is a quote, when Senator Domenici told Gonzalez he wanted Iglesias out in the spring of 2006, you refused, I'm quoting now from the article, and told Senator Domenici you'd fire Iglesias only on orders from the President. In your testimony you provide, you characterize Mr. Iglesias as a fine lawyer, dedicated professional, gave many years of service to the Department. But in your March 7 column in U.S. Today, you wrote that he was asked to leave because he simply lost your confidence. When and why did he lose your confidence? Senator. Mr. Iglesias, like these other United States attorneys, I, I recognize their service. I recognize their courage to serve the American people. Mr. Iglesias lost the confidence of Senator Domenici, as I recall, in the fall of 2005 when he called me 
and said something to the effect that he, Mr. Iglesias was in over his head uh, and that uh, he was concerned that Mr. Iglesias did not have the appropriate personnel focused on cases like public corruption <laughs> cases, <coughs> mention specific cases, he simply said public corruption cases. I don't recall Mr. Senator Domenici ever requesting that Mr. Iglesias be removed. He simply complained Good about point. the uh, whether or not Mr. Iglesias was capable of continuing all, that position. With all due respect, Mr. Attorney General, my question wasn't what, when he may have lost the confidence of Senator Domenici. My question is when and why did he lose your confidence? Senator, what I what I instructed Mr. Sampson to do was consult with people in the department. When and why did he lose your confidence? Based upon the recommendation, what I understood to be the, re the consensus recommendation of the senior leadership in the department, then in fact these there were issues and concerns about the performance of these individuals. And that's when I made the decision to accept the recommendation and in fact it would be appropriate to make a change in this particular district. Now, the um, fact that Mr. Iglesias appeared on the list again was not surprising to me because I'd already had heard concerns about Mr. Iglesias' performance. In a March 21 op-ed in the New York Times, Mr. Iglesias addressed the reasons he believes he was fired. And let me just quote from it. And this is, these are his words. As this story has unfolded these last few weeks, much has been made of my decision to not prosecute alleged voter fraud in New Mexico. <laughs> Without the benefit of reviewing evidence gleaned from FBI investigative reports, party officials in my state have said I should have begun a prosecution. But the critics who don't have any experience as prosecutors have asserted is reprehensible, namely that I should have proceeded without having proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The public has a right to believe that prosecution decisions are made on legal, not political grounds. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that. Uh, Justice Department officials, including your principal associate, Deputy Mr. Michelle, have said that one of the reasons Mr. Glacius was replaced because, in their words, he was an absentee landlord. But I understand he continues his service as an officer in the Naval Reserve and that fulfilling his Naval Reserve responsibilities to take him out of the office of approximately 40 days a year. Uh, you are aware, I assume, that the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act and other laws prohibit employers from denying an individual employment benefits because of their military service? I am aware of that. I support it strongly and we enforce that act. When, and when, how and by whom did this absentee landlord rationale for replacing Mr. Glacius arise? Senator, that rationale was not in my mind as I recall when I accepted the recommendation. We have of course several other United States attorneys who have performed military service. I applaud it and I support it. It would not be a reason that I would ask a United States attorney well, me, uh, to leave. Let me ask you about absentee landlords. On uh, You have a, a Mr. Mercer who is currently serving as your acting associate attorney general, even though he's U.S. attorney in Montana. Uh, the chief judge out there has been very, very critical of the way that office has run, the fact that he's gone. How many days a year does Mr. Mercer stand stay here uh, serving as your associ acting associate attorney general rather than the job he was confirmed for. Senator, that, that's a question, uh, an answer that I have to get back to you. But I, but I think every United States attorney... Well, do you have any general idea? I mean, is it like a week a year? Is it several months a year? Sir, Senator, I, let, let me get back with you with the but most he's, accurate he's information. Your, he's your associate attorney general. I mean, you'd, you would certainly know whether it was a week a year or several months a year, wouldn't Sen you? Senator, I'd, I'd like to give you that information, but, but the main point I want the American people to understand is that, is that every case is different with respect to serving in dual hat capacities. Well, what is I've heard no one complain about the fact that Pat Fitzgerald was prosecuted. I'm not talking that about case, Mr. Fitzgerald. While he was still serving I'm, as United States about, Attorney. Because every I'm case talking is about a, an office that the judge himself says is in disarray in Montana, and Mr. Mercer has testified that he's in Montana just three days a month, three days a month, uh, while he's acting as your associate uh, attorney general. I just mentioned that because if we're talking about absentee landlords, sometimes the absentee landlords are created by your own office. Can I, can I, can I respond to that? Certainly, and then it's Mr. Spector's time. 
in my travels talking to the United States attorneys, I, I, I raise this issue whether or not dual hatting continues to be a good idea to a person. I don't recall any dissent. They all thought it was good. It was good for the U U.S. attorney to get transparency into the Department of Justice. They also believed it was, it was important for them to be able to call someone they knew working in the Department of Justice. Every case is different. It may depend upon how strong the first assistant is. It may, upon, may depend upon the strength of the other uh, chiefs in that office. So every case is going to be different, Senator. And so the fact that someone can do it, like Mr. Fitzgerald, depends on a lot of different circumstances. In my, in my, my state, I'd be pretty upset if the U.S. Attorney is there only three days a month. Senator Spector. And Senator, your views would be very important. I'd be interested to know what those views are. Mr. Attorney General, in uh, my opening statement, I raised the issue as to whether you had been candid, more bluntly truthful, in your statements about not being involved in, quote, discussions, not being involved in, quote, deliberations, not seeing a memoranda. And then in your opening statement, you said two things which appear to me to be carrying forward this same pattern of not being candid. You said that you were only involved to a limited extent in the process. And then you say you should have been more precise. Well, it's not exactly a matter of precision to say that you discuss the issues or were involved in deliberations and decisions, that is just a very basic, fundamental fact. Now let me review some of the record with you. And we don't have much time, and it's necessary to go through it in a rather summary basis, but I know you're familiar with this record because I know you've been preparing for this, uh, this hearing. I prepare for every hearing, Senator. Do you prepare for all your press conferences? Were you prepared for the press conference where you said there weren't any discussions involving you? Senator, I've already said that I misspoke. It was my were mistake. You, well, I, I'm asking you, were you prepared? You interjected that you're always prepared. Were you prepared for Senator, that press conference? I didn't say that I was always prepared. I said I prepared for every hearing. Well, and I'm asking you, do you prepare for your press conferences? Senator, we, we, we do take time to try to prepare for the press conference. And were you prepared when you said you weren't involved in any deliberations? Senator, I've, I've already conceded that I misspoke at that, at that press conference. There was nothing intentional. And the truth of the matter is, Senator, I... Sh let's, 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 let's move on. I don't think you're going to win a debate about your preparation, frankly. But let's get, let's get, let's get to the facts. Uh, I'd like you to win this debate. Attorney General Gonzalez, I'd like you to win this debate. I apologize. But Senator. you're going to have to win it. This is what uh, some of the record shows. And this is according to sworn testimony from your Chief of Staff, Kyle Sampson, from the Acting Associate Attorney General, Bill Mercer, and by the Executive Director of the Office of U.S. Attorneys, Michael Battle. You had a first conversation with Sampson in December of 2004 about replacing U.S. attorneys. <clears throat> then there were intervening events, but I'll come to some of the highlights. On June 1st, 2006, in an email, Samson described your statements on a plan addressing U.S. Attorney Lamb's problems with the option of removing her. Certainly sounds like uh, more than discussions, deliberations, and judgments. I'm going to go on because I want to feed you, I want to give you the whole picture here. Then on June 4th or 5th, according to sworn testimony, Attorney G Mercer discussed with you Lamb's performance. Then on June 13th of 2006, Samson, sworn testimony, said that you, quote, almost certainly consulted on the removal of Bud Cummings. Then in mid-October, you've now identified a date of October 11th, you went to the White House to talk about your vote fraud concerns, Mr. Rove, with the President personally. 
came back and according to Sampson's sworn testimony said, look into the vote prosecution issues, including those in New Mexico. That's what Sampson says under sworn testimony. Then on November 27th of 2006, you attended a meeting on the removal plans attended by Samson, Goodling, McNulty, Battle, uh, a whole host of people. Now, I've just given you a part of the picture uh, as to what these three deputies of yours, high-ranking deputies, have said that you did uh, on talking about removal, talking about replacements, now, do you think it is a fair, honest characterization to say that you had only a, quote, limited involvement in the process, close quote? Senator, I, I don't want to quarrel with you. Uh, I don't want I, you to either. I just want you to answer the question. Sir, I guess it, it's... I had knowledge that there was a process going on. I don't know all you didn't, the... You didn't understand there was a process going on? No, I had... sir. I had knowledge that there was a process going on. Well, were you involved in it? Senator, with respect to Carol Lamb, for example. Were you involved in the process? I was involved in the process, yes, sir. Were you involved to a limited extent only? Yes, sir. How much more could you have been involved than to be concerned about the replacement of Cummings and to evaluate Lamb and to be involved in Inglesias? Now, we haven't gone over the others, but is that limited in your professional judgment? Based on what I thought that I understood was, was going on, yes, Senator. I, I thought Mr. Sampson, I directed Mr. Sampson to consult with senior officials in the department who had information about the performance of United States attorneys. I believe that that was ongoing and that, that, that he would bring back to me a consensus recommendation. The discussion about Ms. Lamb, never in my mind, was about this review process. And I indicated so in my conversation with Pete Williams, I believe on March 26, is that we were doing this process. Of course, there were other discussions outside of the review process about the performance of United States attorneys. I can't simply stop doing my supervisor responsibilities uh, over United States attorneys because this review process is going. Did you tell Mercer to take a look at Lamb's record with a view to having her removed as a U.S. attorney? Senator, or, what or is he wrong? I don't recall. Here's what, Senator, what I recall is, uh, of course, I'd we had received, the department had received numerous complaints about Carol Lamb's performance with respect to gun prosecutions and immigration prosecutions. I directed that we take a look at those numbers because I wanted to know. And I don't, I, I don't recall whether it was Mr. Mercer who presented me the numbers, but I recall being very concerned. But you were involved in evaluating U.S. Attorney Lamb's record, weren't you? Senator, I did not view that. And I this was my, I did not view that as part of Mr. Sampson's project of trying to, con trying to analyze and understand the performance of United States attorneys never for possible mind, removal. Mr. Never mind Mr. Sampson's project. Weren't you involved in the evaluation of U.S. Attorney Lamb? Senator, of course I was involved in, in trying to weren't understand. You, weren't you involved in the decision on the removal of Arkansas U.S. Attorney Bud Cummings as Kyle Sampson testified. Senator, I, I, have no, I have no recollection about that, but I, I presume that that is true. Weren't you involved in the decisions with respect to U.S. Attorney Inglesias in New Mexico, as you've already testified in response to the chairman's questions? Senator, I, I do recall having the conversation with Mr. Rove. I now understand that there was a conversation between myself and the president, and at some point, Mr. Sampson brought me what I understood to be the consensus recommendation of the senior leadership that we ought to make a change in that district. Okay, now we've got to evaluate, and this is a final statement before I yield, as to whether the limited number of circumstances that I have recited, and it's only a limited number, there are many, many more, whether you are being candid in saying that you were involved only to a limited, you only had a, quote, limited involvement in the process. Uh, as to being candid, and also as to having sound judgment, if you consider that limited. And 
as we recite these, we have to evaluate whether you are really being forthright and saying that you, sh quote, should have been more precise, close quote, when the reality is that your characterization of your participation is just totally, significantly, if not totally, at variance with the facts. Senator, you're talking about a series of events that occurred over approximately 700 days. I probably had thousands of conversations during that time. Uh, and so putting it in context, Senator, I would say that my involvement was limited. I think that is an accurate statement. That it was limited involvement. And with respect to certain communications, such as the communication with the President, such as the discussions about Carol Lamb, I did not view that at the time as part of this review process. I simply considered those as doing part of my job. We'd heard complaints about the performance of Ms. Lamb. I directed the department to try to ascertain whether or not those complaints were legitimate. And if not, we ought to look at perhaps doing something about it. Chairman says I can ask one more question. You're saying it's not part of the process you thought a part of your job? Is that what you're saying? Senator, because if you are, I don't understand it. Senator, I, I didn't consider it as part of this project that Mr. Sampson was working on. I, I, <coughs> simply because we had this process ongoing by Mr. Sampson doesn't mean that, that, we, that I quit doing my job as Attorney General and supervising the work of the United States Attorneys. And that's what I attempted to do. But it was intimately connected with her qualifications to stay on. Senator, in, of course, in hindsight, I look back now that, of course, that that may have affected the recommendations made to me, yes. But, Senator, when I focused on those complaints, I wasn't thinking about this process to remove U.S. attorneys. What I was focusing on a complaint that I had received about her performance. That's what I was focused on. I wasn't focused on the review process itself. I wasn't focused on whether or not her name would go on this list. I was focused on making sure she was doing her job. That's what I was focused on. Uh, so that uh, senators can focus on where they're going to be. Uh, the order on, on the Democratic side will be uh, going back and forth, of course. Uh, senators. Kennedy, Cole, Feinstein, Feingold, Schumer, Durbin, Cardin, White House, and Biden. And the list I have from the uh, Republican side, it would, it would be Senators Grassley, Cornyn, Brownback, Hatch, Sessions, Graham, Coburn, and Kyle. And following what I said I'd do earlier, I take that list uh, from, uh, <coughs> from Senator Specter. So, Senator Kennedy. Um, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we appreciate, uh, General, your uh, sentiments about this uh, horrific tragedy. I think all of us here in the uh, committee, all Americans, know that that is certainly something that's hanging over all of our hearts at this, uh, at this very uh, important and sad time. Uh, just to come back uh, to some themes that have been talked about a little bit here uh, earlier, uh, during the course of this uh, hearing. In your opening statement, you indicated, as Senator Specter uh, mentioned, that you had a limited involvement and that the process was not vigorous. Um, the question is, and then you say, my decision is justified and should stand. Well, since you apparently knew very little about the performance of the replaced U.S. attorneys, how can you testify that they the judgment ought to stand? I think that's a what's fair... The what's the basis for I that? I think that's a fair question, Senator. Uh, obviously, when, when this began, uh, I did not... I was not the person in the department who had the most information about the performance and qualification of U.S. attorneys. There were, there were many other people particularly the Deputy Attorney General. And, and uh, I, I challenge Mr. Sampson, my chief of, then my Deputy Chief of Staff, to engage in a review. I think it was perfectly appropriate to see where we could make changes to benefit the performance of the Department of Justice. And what I understood and what I expected is he would talk to people like the Deputy Attorney General uh, to, to ascertain how U.S. attorneys were performing. And of course, when the recommendation was presented to me, I understood it recommended the consensus view of the senior leadership of the department. Well, I'm going to ask you, how can you know that none of them were removed for improper reasons? 
How can you give us those assurances since you had a limited involvement, the process wasn't vigorous, and you left it basically to somebody else? Well, Senator, since then, of course, I have gone back and looked at the documents made available to Congress. I also had a conversation this with is the since, deputy. With since the de then. Yes, sir. But when you made the judgment and decision, when you made the judgment and decision, you didn't know, did you? On December 7th, I know the basis on which I made the decision. No reasons that would be characterized as improper. I think I was justified. But you didn't know whether those decisions were proper or improper since you've said you had limited involvement, the progress was not vigorous, and you basically gave the assignment to Mr. Sampson. S Senator, uh, he I testified and you approved. I think that I'm, I'm justified in relying upon what I understood to be the, the, the recommendation, the consensus recommendation of the senior leadership. And I, I think as we look through the documents, as you glean through the documents, nothing improper occurred here. You've, you have more information about the testimony of witnesses than I do. I'm not aware that anyone based their recommendation on improper reasons, but that, just to be sure, I've asked the Office of Professional Responsibility to work with the of Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Justice uh, to ensure that nothing improper happened here. Uh, well, I, I, uh, getting back to the time that you made the judgment and decision, you didn't really know the actual reasons uh, when uh, you approved the removal, did you? Senator, at I, the time, I have in my mind a recollection as to knowing as to some of these United States attorneys. There are two that I that I do not recall knowing in my mind uh, what I understood to be the reasons for the removal. But as to the others, I recall knowing uh, the reasons why independently. I was not surprised to see their names recommended to me because. Through my uh, performance as Attorney General, I had become aware of specific issues related to performance. Well, we're, we're reminded that the documents don't show any clear rationale for the, the firings. But I want to come back to how you can say in your opening statement that the Department of Justice makes decisions based on evidence. That's, that certainly was not the case with regards to your judgment and decisions with regards to these firings. As I understand, you said you had limited involvement, the process is not vigorous. In response to Se Senator Leahy, you said uh, you weren't responsible for compiling information. How can you give a blanket statement that the Department of Justice makes decisions based on evidence when we don't have the rationale even for the firings uh, of these uh, of the individuals at the time that they were fired. Senator, that, that same related to our decisions with respect to prosecutions, but with respect to what happened here, I, I believe that I had a good process when this began. Uh, let me I, ask about the process, if I could, please. The Department of Justice has a process. It's called the EARS process. It's been in effectively for the evaluation of U.S. attorneys. It's been there for years and years. But uh, am, am I uh, uh, correct? That's the uh, Department of Justice periodic comprehensive evaluation, U.S. attorneys, it's called EARS reports for evaluation and report staff reports. Sir, We're that evaluation is, a, is an evaluation that occurs of United States attorney offices. Okay. It occurs every three or five years. It is a peer review, Senator. It is a, a review conducted by assistant United States attorneys. I'm asking you, did you have an opportunity, since it does review the performance of U.S. attorneys, did you have an opportunity to review that document, which is the standard document for the Justice Department in the evaluation of U.S. attorneys. Senator, I, I did not review the document, but however, it would be just one of many factors, I think, right. should be appropriately considered in evaluating the performance of the United Let States attorneys. Just some one others. of many factors. Did you speak personally with any of the, have you spoken with any of the replaced U.S. attorneys about their performance? Have you, at this time, talked to any of the U.S. attorneys that Who were replaced? replaced? Yes. I have spoken with Mr. Bogdan. He's the only one. He is the only one. Did you yes. speak with any of the assistant U.S. attorneys in the affected offices of the U.S. attorneys? Did you talk to any of the assistant U.S. attorneys? Uh, Those that are ser serving with the U.S. attorneys that have been replaced, did you speak in, in, uh, with any of them? Sir, I certainly did it with respect to San Diego. That may, I, I, there may be assistant United States attorneys who may be serving uh, as the acting U.S. attorney that, that I may have met with in connection with my visit uh, to visit with the United States attorneys uh, af sometime in, in the weeks of March 12th and, and thereafter. So you may have met with someone that was in one of the different uh, offices. 
I, I believe that I, I probably met with everyone who was ser who was serving in the effective offices who were serving as in the acting U.S. attorney capacity, and certainly with respect to San Diego, I did visit the San Diego office this and I spoke to the, the office. This the before the firings. Oh no, sir! This is well after the firings. Uh, oh, sir, did sir, you uh, perform any systematic review of the effect of the ongoing prosecutions? by removing the U.S. attorneys? What would be the impact of ongoing prosecutions that those U.S. attorneys were involved in? Did sir, you do an evaluation of that? Sir, I think that's a good question. I think, I think it's important for the American people to understand that public uh, prosecutions are, are done primarily by assistant United States